Would you punish your children forever? I assume you'd say no. I just wanted to hear you say it. So why would God, who is love, punish his children forever? Are you more loving than God? I assumed you'd say no. I just wanted to hear you say it. Welcome to The Biggest Jesus, where you'll hear the truth of the successful Savior, the Savior of all. In 2009, after about 18 years in Orthodox Christianity, I came to believe in the salvation of all through the successful work of God and His Son. When I sat down and told my family this, they were skeptical. I had believed, taught, and preached for 17 to 18 years about eternal torment for those who don't believe in Jesus in this life. And for about a year or so, I taught that unbelievers would be annihilated. So I understood my family's skepticism. I did a complete 180 in my understanding of God's work of salvation and God's judgment for unbelievers. I'd been studying a lot on my own because I wanted to be sure in my own heart that I was actually understanding the truth from the scriptures before I presented it to my family. My wife was probably the most skeptical and she wasn't afraid to question me about it. She's always been one to give her opinion and I appreciate that very much about her. She didn't buy into what I was telling her at first, but we discussed it. What sealed the deal for her was was this question that she pondered in her own mind. Would she, as a parent, punish any of her three children forever? Her obvious answer, and her logical answer, was no. She would not do that. That question, would you punish your children forever, brought the issue home to her. It made it real to her what it must be like as God looks down upon his children on this earth. She logically understood that if she wouldn't punish her children forever, then God, who is far more loving than her, would not punish his children forever. Now, whenever my wife discusses this issue with people that don't quite get what she's saying, they don't agree with her, this is her go-to question. Would you punish any of your children forever? And the answer that she gets, invariably, is no. No one would punish their children forever. And another question that she poses to people is this. What could your child do that would cause you to punish them forever? The answer is nothing. These are great questions because it causes us to take somewhat of an abstract idea of the punishment of someone forever and brings it home to us as we can relate to our relationship with our own children. These are great questions that make people think and we need to think. And it's a very good strategy because Jesus himself employed similar questions to get people to think. Luke 15, 1 through 7 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. Now all the tribute collectors and sinners were coming near him to be hearing him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man sinners is receiving and is eating with them. Now he told them this parable, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, is not leaving the ninety-nine in the wilderness and is going after the lost one till he may be finding it? And finding it, he is placing it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And coming into the house, he is calling together the friends and the neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice together with me that I found my sheep that was lost. I am saying to you that thus there will be joy in heaven over one sinner repenting, more than over ninety-nine just persons who have no need of repentance. Here we see Jesus in verse 4 asking the question, What man of you? This is very similar to asking the question, would you punish your children forever? The obvious answer to Jesus' question to the Pharisees, the scribes, and the rest of the people in the group is, yes, I would go after that lost sheep. That lost sheep is valuable to me. The money-grubbing Pharisees definitely would not leave one of their sheep out in the wilderness to perish. They should rejoice that God came to save sinners. Instead, they grumble and complain. God goes after lost sheep. And in this passage, it's interesting that sheep are representative of sinners. And what did Jesus do regarding sinners? He came to save them, all of them. Luke 19.10 and 1 Timothy 1.15 give us very clearly what Jesus came to do in regard to sinners. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Mankind came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't just come to seek, but to save. That is his mission, to save the lost, all of the lost, even those up to the very last one that is out in the wilderness that has strayed. 
and 1 Timothy 1.15. Faithful is the saying and worthy of all welcome that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, foremost of whom am I. Again, we see that he came into the world to save sinners. And Jesus has just revealed to us in the Luke 15 passage how valuable each sinner is to him and to God. Some argue that these passages don't say all, but if we refer back to what we just read in Luke 15, that he will go after the one. Even though everyone else is safe and at home, if there's one in the wilderness, he will seek it and he will save it. And another evidence that this is speaking of all sinners, the Apostle Paul wrote that he was the foremost of the sinners. Is he the foremost of just the sinners that were Pharisees? the foremost of Jewish sinners, or is he the foremost of all sinners? Paul is saying that he is the foremost of all sinners. Are you happy that Jesus came to save all of us sinners? Or does that make you angry? Do you grumble like the Pharisees? Regarding posing this question to people, would you punish your own children forever? I'm going to assume an objection that many of you may have. It probably goes something like this. No, I wouldn't punish my kids forever, but I'm not God, and his ways are higher than ours. Dummy. <laughs> you dummy? What a dummy. <laughs> help me, Jesus. Help, help me, Jesus. No, if God were to punish his children forever, that would make his ways lower than our ways, not higher. Besides, what does it even mean that God's ways are higher than ours? This might surprise you. Isaiah 55, 7-9 from the Concordant Version of the Old Testament. Yahweh is speaking, Let the wicked one forsake his way, and the lawless man his devisings, and let him return to Yahweh, and he shall have compassion on him and to our Elohim, for he shall multiply pardon. For my designs are not your designs, and your ways are not my ways, a varying is Yahweh. For as the heavens are loftier than the earth, so are my ways loftier than your ways, and my designs than your designs. Obviously, God's ways are higher than ours, but in this context, it is speaking about the highness of his compassion and the fact that he will multiply pardon. He is speaking here to wayward Israel. God's ways in judgment, compassion, and mercy are far beyond and above man's ways as revealed in this scripture. To use the his ways are higher than our ways excuse to justify God punishing his children forever is not wise. Concerning the issue at hand, God's ways are far superior to ours. We might not punish our children forever, but what about our enemies? What would we do to them? This is how God is far superior and his ways are higher than ours. He is not only merciful to those that love him, he is merciful to his enemies. And he is able to transform his enemies into his friends by grace and love. That is how God is higher than us. Just how merciful is our Heavenly Father? Romans 11.32 reveals to us the great capacity of our Father's mercy. For God locks up all together in stubbornness, that he should be merciful to all. There is no doubt that stubbornness has existed in all of us. And that comes from the hand of God locking us together in stubbornness. But that is not the end for anyone. The end result of this, that he should be merciful to all. The same all that are locked together in stubbornness are those who will receive mercy from God. It is our experience of stubbornness and mercy that makes us who we are. This is done in the wisdom of God. The definition of mercy is a moderation of the severity of justice. Many argue that God can't save all because he is a just God. He is just and he knows exactly how to bring about justice. But because he is God, he can be merciful in any of his just acts. And that's exactly what he will do. He will be merciful to all. Please realize that all judgments are Ionian. None are everlasting or eternal. God has chosen to use the word Ion and Ionian to reveal to us the duration of the judgments. In this, God is merciful even in his severest judgments. Let's quickly compare four translations of one of the go-to verses for eternal tormentus and annihilationists. 
that they use to say that God cannot save all. From the Concordant Literal New Testament, who shall incur the justice of Ionian extermination from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his strength? Young's Literal, who shall suffer justice, destruction aged during from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his strength? The ESV, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. The KJV, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. The words Ionian, age during, eternal, and everlasting all come from the Greek adjective Aeonian, which comes from the Greek noun Ion which is a time span with a beginning and an end. Things Aeonian have a beginning and an end. Therefore, Aeonian in the Concordant Literal New Testament and Age During in Young's Literal Translation are proper translations of this word Aeonian. The ESV's translation of eternal and the KJV's everlasting do not fit the Greek that underlies these translations. Those are false translations. Therefore, the destruction, the extermination is limited. It is Aeonian. It is age during. It is not eternal. It is not everlasting. Now, a final question to ponder. If you were able, would you rescue your children from everlasting death? I knew you'd say yes. I just wanted to hear you say it. Here's the good news. God is able and he is willing. He is will do it. Thank you for watching this video. Here's a video that shows why no one will remain dead forever.